the right to vote is really at the heart of what it means to be an American citizen. Every vote matters, but according to exit polls in the 2012 presidential election, women's votes mattered more because they simply outnumbered the men by making up 53% of the votes. It's hard to believe with numbers like that that women have only had the right to cast a ballot for less than 100 years. And the battle for the right to vote started long before that. It's fascinating to look at how far women have come in their fight for liberty and their fight for equality. And although we have uh, many steps yet to go in the United States, to think that in just a couple of short generations, women have gone from literally not having the right to vote to being the biggest voter base in the United States. But getting to where we are today took years and years of hard work and sacrifice for the men and women who believed everyone should have a vote. And many of the most influential leaders in the movement and most impactful events took place right here in Northeast Ohio. The suffrage movement began on rural farms and in big cities. It started slowly, but quickly built up momentum. As soon as the United States was founded, women were arguing for political rights. According to Dr. Malia McAndrew, Associate Professor of History at John Carroll University, one of the more famous and early interchanges on the subject is a set of letters between John Adams and his wife Abigail Adams in 1776. So while John was off fighting war against the British, trying to form an independency, she's writing him letters and she's very clear in these letters that she hopes he will quote unquote remember the ladies. In her letter, the future First Lady mentions that she longs to hear that he has declared an independency and that when a new code of laws is created, she hopes he would be more favorable to women than their ancestors, saying, do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Now, he responds to her in a joking way and tells her that he thinks she's very, being very saucy. Um, and he never to her directly states this, but he says to his friends that, hey, I don't think women are really capable of the vote. But as years passed, more and more people were starting to believe that women should have the same rights as men. Suffrage, defined as the right to vote in political elections, and the suffrage movement was getting underway. And to endeavor to carry out in the interest of our whole people, the policies to which you have today solemnly dedicated yourselves in the name of the millions of men and women for whom you seek. Surely there never was a fight better worth making than the one which we are in. The women's suffrage movement timeline runs from 1840 to 1920. According to the National Women's History Museum, it started when Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were barred from attending the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London. They then decided to hold a women's convention in the United States in 1848 in Seneca Falls, New York. The convention spanned two days and about 200 women attended. Two weeks later, an even larger meeting was held in Rochester, New York. Women then began having conventions annually. But Ohio's central in this. After the famous 1848 Seneca Falls Conference, women gathered again in 1851, right here in Akron, Ohio, as part of a national women's meeting to talk about how are we going to forward our agenda, how are we going to improve our situation and, and eventually gain the right to vote. A strong alliance had been formed between the suffrage and the abolitionist movements, and at this Akron convention, Sojourner Truth, a former slave and activist, delivered her memorable speech. Where she basically says, I have borne the lash, and I have raised children, and I have worked the fields like no one else can, and ain't I a woman? And nobody ever put down a, a petticoat for me in front of a puddle, and I have done a lot of things. So this argument that you're making that women that were not capable of voting, that we're too delicate, we're too fragile for this discourse, well, well, aren't I a woman? According to Elizabeth Smith Pryor, Associate Professor of History at Kent State University, women who were involved in the suffrage movement in the United States were also learning tactics from women in Europe. Alice Paul, who was a leader in the suffrage movement in the early 20th century, had spent time in Great Britain 
and had seen what the British suffragettes were doing. Was interested in the way in which they used things like pageantry, dressing in particular ways, carrying big banners, uh, doing these big spectacles, but also saw the ways in which they were willing to essentially put their bodies on the line by and getting arrested. Women were not only organizing conventions, but were protesting and picketing in places like the White House. Many served terms in jail for picketing or obstructing traffic. Groups of women went on hunger strikes while in prison, and some were violently force-fed. Pioneers in the women's suffrage movement, like Susan B. Anthony, worked tirelessly trying to convince others across the country to support a woman's right to vote. She even went so far as to vote in the 1872 presidential election illegally, leading to her arrest. She was fined $100, a fine she reportedly never paid. There were pockets of women who traveled great distances to proselytize their movement. Ohio was an, certainly an important stop in this movement. Ohio was an important place. Ending slavery and gaining women's rights was, were connected goals for some suffragettes, not for all, right? Some supported uh, women's emancipation, but not the emancipation of informally enslaved people. Right after the Civil War, African American men in the United States were free, had citizenship, and also the right to vote. But even though African American women didn't get the right to vote, they saw it as equally theirs, a vote decided on within their family. And many African American women were extremely active in the political process. They wore political buttons. They went to political organizing events. They oftentimes manned a gun to protect themselves against people who didn't want them to be involved in politics. And sometimes it even went as far as to possibly kicking their husband to the couch if they weren't going to vote for, for the party of Lincoln. Many women were no longer willing to accept that they didn't belong in the so-called rough and tumble world of politics of the 19th century. People were out in public culture drinking and smoking and interacting and doing things that weren't seen as ladylike for the time. So many people disagreed with the idea of women voting because they thought that it would bring women into a political culture that they might be harassed in, uh, that they might be attacked in, that they might have things thrown on them in, and they wanted to protect women's kind of ladylike sentiments. The suffrage movement wasn't only about women's right to vote, but also about improving women's rights overall. I, mean, I think here in Ohio, there aren't laws passed to allow married women to uh, begin to own property in their own name until really about the 1860s. It starts here. So it's, it's pretty late. You know, there's this the idea that women don't know what to do with this property. It's better for it to be held by men who are going to use it um, in the way it's meant to be used. But women disagreed, and one of the main reasons for women's fight for equal rights in the U.S. is because more and more women were becoming educated. Many of the nation's first women's colleges were forming at this time in the late 19th century. And as women became to be more educated and became to uh, attend formalized educational systems or to be tutored in the home, they started to demand more rights, right? Uh, knowledge is power. And in part what happens is uh, in, as the anti-slavery movement and very slowly is growing in the 1840s, there are many women who begin to see the ways in which women are not allowed to act, um, that it's considered improper for women to speak in front of um, audiences that include both men and women. That's con considered promiscuous. And really begin to think about that there's a need for, that women aren't getting their full rights. Their identity is subsumed under that of their husbands or their fathers or their brothers. Women started joining together to create their own groups where they could exercise their political power and set their own agendas. One of those groups was the Women's Christian Temperance Union, founded in Cleveland, Ohio in 1874. One of their main political agendas was to outlaw alcohol. Because that they thought that alcohol was one of the things that was causing men to be irresponsible with the family's money, that they might be spending it at the bar, at saloons with their friends instead of on meals for, with their children. And so women, long before women had the right to vote, created what we went to see today as um, a political action organization that fought to change American society to outlaw alcohol. The late 19th century and early 20th century is also a time of great change. American women are not only becoming educated, but also entering into the public sphere, working in offices, retail spaces, even factories, shaping the world we now live in. So you can't talk about women's 
suffrage without talking about the history of feminism because this was a, a political movement that fundamentally wanted to alter the power structure in the United States as it had been playing out. One of the early visionaries who believed women did have a lot to offer in society and in the workforce was a Clevelander by the name of Henry Sherwin. In 1866, one year after the Civil War, he founded and became CEO of Sherwin-Williams which quickly became the number one paint company in North America after just several years in business. Sherwin-Williams was created in Cleveland from the ground up at a time when there were no electric lights, typewriters, automobiles, or ready-use paint. In fact, the company developed the first reliable ready-mix can of paint in 1880, which revolutionized the industry. 150 years later, Sherwin-Williams is the number three paint and coating company in the world. Henry was a dynamic leader who lifted women into leadership positions from the very beginning. Emily Young is pictured in this 1906 photo as an employee of 25 years. She led the sales floor of the varnishes and was the first woman executive at Sherwin-Williams, an outstanding achievement for the time period. There is even a conference room named after her today. Henry and his wife Frances Mary Smith Sherwin had three daughters. Belle Sherwin, born in 1868, was the oldest. She was passionate, she was committed to equality for all people, but especially women. According to Monica Fitzgerald, Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Sherwin-Williams, Belle was also very well educated and went off to college at a time when not many women did. She went to Wesley College, and then she also went on to the Oxford University where she completed her graduate studies. She was the very first president of the Consumers League of Ohio. And then following up to that, she was the president of the League of Women Voters. Bell also became director of the Public Health Nursing Association and of the Cleveland Welfare Fund after returning to Cleveland in 1900. In 1916, Bell joined Frances Payne Bolton to found the Women's City Club, promoting women's educational and civic involvement, and it was an immediate success. It drew 1,700 members for programs that prepared women to vote. She chaired the Women's Committee of the 1917 Mayor's Advisory. Bell was following in the footsteps of her father by becoming an influential leader, not only locally in Northeast Ohio, but across the nation. The June-July 1924 edition of the company's newsletter called The Chameleon announces Bell Sherwin, daughter of Henry, elected to the League of Women Voters, saying she displays the same executive ability that was her father's to a marked degree. Bell served as the president of the National League of Women's Voters in Washington, D.C. from 1924 to 1934. Bell was instrumental in helping women understand that we do have a role at the table. We do have a seat in leadership positions. And all of her work gave us that platform so that we could do that in today's society. It's clear that today's leaders at Sherwin-Williams are proud of the founding family who shaped their company so many years ago. Their history is literally written on the walls in their History and Greeting Center, the Center of Excellence. Even when you walk through our Center of Excellence, there are lots of artifacts that point back to the history of women and also the founder, Henry Sherwin. We have the Code of Principles, which has 10 facts that talks about loyalty to the organization, being broad and liberal in our thoughts, being considerate and passionate to one another, amongst other things. There is a section dedicated to a women's club called the Bug Club, which was founded in 1911. Bug stood for Brighten Up Girls. In the early years, women in the group got together to socialize and make things by hand, like baby dolls. Bell's values that revolved around women and leadership roles is what inspired the Sherwin-Williams Club. In 1940, a metal chain was started, with each link representing a tenured worker of 25 years. The link is etched with their name and years worked. Today, it is on display in the Sherwin-Williams Center of Excellence, and women's names are still being added to those links. The club has changed a bit over the years, but it still exists for female employees. It's a philanthropic organization that goes out into the community and supports the initiatives for the organizations and also provides professional development for the women at the organization. Bell's values, much like her father's, are still an integral part of Sherwin-Williams, and current leaders in the company, like Monica Fitzgerald, ensure that those founding principles will remain at the core of the company into the future. I'm really proud of the work that Bell Sherwin did in the early 1900s. That definitely presented opportunities for me to be in the role that I'm currently in today, and the organization that I work for is phenomenal. 
this organization believes in having women in leadership who can bring great ideas, educational ideas and experiences to the table. And to be in this role is, it's a, it's a great honor. Although women like Bell were driving the women's suffrage movement, many men were also supportive and believed in equal rights for their wives, mothers, daughters, and sisters. But there always are some men that are, that are open to it. I mean, clearly even here in Ohio, there are a number of times before Congress passes you know, the 19th Amendment and it goes to the states for ratification, there are people introducing you know, legislation to try to change the state constitution to allow women the right to vote. I mean, it fails, and presumably it's men who are the ones, because they're, they're the only ones in the legislature who could be introducing these things. So there always are some men who are supporting women's rights. At the same time, not all women wanted the right to vote. They didn't think that it was their place in society. While others had been fighting and fighting for years for women's right to vote, women were not a monolith. They didn't think the same things throughout history. And so after women received the right to vote, many within the United States embraced it. Uh, but others saw it as, as a negative turn and saw it as something that would diminish women's role in society, women's ability to be protected by the laws. So there was not universal acceptance or universal enthusiasm for women gaining the, gaining the right to vote. She says there were also multiple movements, a national movement going on at the same time as a state movement, and sometimes these movements clashed with each other. When people like Alice Paul were doing hunger strikes and protesting in public, other women were saying, no, that, that's taking away from the more underground, fly under the radar level of politics that we're trying to do. But on August 18, 1920, women officially got the right to vote when the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution granted American women suffrage. Belle Sherwin, who lived into her late 80s in the 1950s, was able to see all of her hard work to fruition and cast her vote like many other women and men who fought so tirelessly for the cause. So although we have far to go in the United States in uh, finding justice for multiple social groups, including women, it is astonishing when you sit back and you think about how much in our society has changed in such a short amount of time. Now, nearly 100 years later, we have the first woman nominated to be president by a major political party, Democrat and former first lady Hillary Clinton. There may be some women, People despite like their, their party affiliation, who may feel excited wages, because we do you know, have a woman candidate. They want their daughters and, and all and those to somebody, see that this is possible. Um, but I'm guessing a lot of it will fall um, down partisan lines, as it always has. I think it's still important, no matter if, you know, for all women to vote, because again, it's something that so many people spent so long fighting for. And just a few generations back, the generation that my grandmother was born into, women didn't even have the right to vote. So that is a stunning rate of progress. And if nothing else, now is a time for us to set aside our politics and to appreciate just what an important, pivotal, watershed moment this is for our country, regardless of how we feel about any individual candidate. She's not the first woman to ever run for president, but she's the first woman to get the endorsement of a major political party. And here we are 16 years into the 21st century. It's taken a long time. Ohioan Victoria Woodhull was actually the first woman to run for president. She was born in 1838 in Homer, Ohio. She became the first female stockbroker on Wall Street, although no woman would officially gain a seat on the New York Stock Exchange until 1967. After attending a women's suffrage meeting in 1869, she became a leader in the cause. In 1870, Victoria announced she was running for president of the United States. She secured a third party nomination by the Equal Rights Party for the 1872 election. She's originally from Ohio, marries here, divorces, moves to New York. She becomes someone who, uh, she runs a magazine. She's seen as a bit scandalous. And even her running for president is seen as kind of somewhat scandalous. Not really uh, a serious run. And I think that's partially why she's not really remembered very well. And why, again, people don't think, oh, of course, Victoria Woodhull, she was the first woman to run. But she was part of an era of women who were trying to uh, break into uh, fields that were predominantly masculine, whether it's, you know, uh, the law, medicine, you know, or even someone like uh, Susan B. Anthony, who actually uh, 
went and voted, got arrested for it, but, <laughs> but went and voted anyway. Even though she doesn't get all of the credit as the first woman running for president, it's important to remember her because she was one of the many women in the late 19th century pushing the barriers for women's rights. And I think it's, it's clear that there have been women from the beginning of this nation who have wanted to make contributions. And again, I think in some ways for, for, for those women, the vote was in part partially a sign of really making a public statement of their significance and importance in the nation. Dr. McAndrews says when we think of women's history, most of us focus on the last 200 years and the eight decades of the suffrage movement. But women's history in our country dates back even further than that, and it didn't always involve women fighting for their rights. There are positive examples of women being enfranchised and being a part of the political process long before the United States was founded. So the Iroquois Confederation, a group that was particularly in upstate New York, but then expanded across the uh, Great Lakes region, were some of the most politically empowered women in all of North America. Because they controlled the land, the food, and food distribution, she says that meant they could also choose to withhold it. They could withhold it from chiefs. Um, they could withhold the ability to eat if they didn't like the fact that the nation was about to go to war. The older women in society, called matrons, even had the political power to remove a chief from control if they felt he wasn't doing a good enough job. She says understanding that women had been involved in the political process for years and that the suffrage movement was about regaining those rights and expanding new rights gives us a more positive view on women's history overall. It changes our view on our own history. And she says it's up to us to remember our past and that history as we move forward. And to use it to inform our future, um, but to become engaged. Um, for our own sake, for the sake of, of generations after us, and, and for the many people who fought and who died for the rights that we enjoy today. Professor McAndrew, who focuses much of her teaching on women's studies, says she stresses to her students that they need to see themselves as part of a generational change. That although we focus a lot on the big watershed moments in history, like women finally getting the right to vote, it took years of struggle and turmoil to get there. Women didn't get the right to vote in one day, or even one lifetime. Slavery wasn't ended in uh, one year or because of one political speech. But if you see yourself as part of a long tide of history, which is moving hopefully in the right direction, then I think it's easier to connect yourself to, to people from the past and the things that they were fighting for and, and hoping to push the ball forward. Don't let the ball drop with you. And although we have come a long way over the past century and women are rising to the ranks in the highest levels in society, she believes we still face different kinds of gender challenges. And we have a number of men who are, who are taking on roles that traditionally went to women, being in the home, raising children, raising the next generation of Americans. So I think we as a society, both men and women, need to figure out how we are going to make this possible for everyone. Which leads to the question, can women have it all? Some say nobody can have it all, but maybe you can have everything you want, just not at the same time. I think that's the next thing that we have to figure out. Now that we value women in the workplace, and that we value and we can hopefully can continue to push to value men's rightful place in the home, then we have to think about how we can enable men and women to make the choices that best suit their preferences and their needs. And so I think that's the next frontier for all of us. A frontier and a challenge made possible in part by the many women and men who fought bravely for women's rights to vote. The Northeast Ohioans who organized the pivotal women's suffrage convention in Akron that gave Sojourner Truth a platform to make one of the most famous speeches in history. Clevelanders like Belle Sherwin, who became a national leader in the movement, and her father, Henry Sherwin, who believed in his daughter and gave women positions of leadership in his company long before it was commonplace and before they were even able to cast a ballot. And Ohioan Virginia Woodhull, the first woman to run for president. Nearly a century after women legally got the right to vote, they are still just as strong of a presence at the polls, even outnumbering the men. A statistic that would have made any suffragist proud and validates the very foundation of the suffrage movement, that everyone has the right to vote and every vote counts.